Whether you're a Christian or not, you're probably pretty familiar with the Christian conception of the afterlife. If you follow Jesus, then when you die, you'll go to heaven. If you don't follow Jesus, then when you die, you'll go to hell. Uh, this is a very basic teaching in the church that most are familiar with. But what if I told you that the Bible's portrait of the afterlife is more complicated than that? I learned this while writing a chapter on resurrection in my book, The Russian Loresta. I thought I could nail it down pretty quick, but the more I researched resurrection, the more I realized that the biblical afterlife is a lot wider in scope than I thought it was. In the Hebrew Old Testament, it was believed that everyone who died went to this same afterlife, a, a space called Sheol. Didn't matter if you were good or bad, followed God or followed a false god. If, if you were a human being, you simply went to Sheol when you died. It wasn't a great place, but it also wasn't necessarily a bad place. But this does sound weird, right? I mean, one afterlife for everyone? Well, believe it or not, Sheol doesn't go away in the Greek New Testament. It just takes on a different name. For what was the place where the Greeks believed all the dead went? Do you remember this from reading the Odyssey in school or, or from Disney's Hercules? Hades, right? Yeah, Meg went to Hades and Hercules had to go to that land of the dead to save her. Therefore, the Greek Hades is conceptually the same as the Hebrew Sheol. So the New Testament didn't do away with Sheol after all. It just changed the name to fit what everyone culturally called it in the Greek language. Now, you're probably taught in church that Hades and hell are the same place in the New Testament, but we've already established that this is not the case. For if Hades is Sheol, then it's the land where all the dead go. And such a place doesn't fit the eternal resurrection life of heaven or the eternal death of hell. All right, now I've probably said enough already to rattle a cage for a few of you, but we've got some more paradigms to shift yet, so hold with me. Because the afterlife according to the Bible is not as simple as Sheol uh, and, and Hades. While the New Testament believed that Hades was a real destination outside of heaven and hell, it also revealed something the Old Testament didn't know. Apparently, God's people don't go to Hades because God saves them from Hades and brings them to heaven. That's why Jesus tells the thief on the cross next to him that he'll see him in paradise after he died. Uh, the thief decided to follow Jesus and was no longer destined for Hades. Likewise, throughout our series on Revelation, we've seen that the Christian martyrs go to dwell in an altar of God's heavenly temple. So yes, the New Testament shows us that the Christian can rest assured that they don't go to Sheol slash Hades when they die. But we're still not done with the Bible's portrait of the afterlife. For there are two places beyond the spiritual state of heaven and the spiritual state of Hades. One day, Christians will actually leave the spiritual state of heaven to establish a physical state of heaven on the earth with new physical bodies. We just talked about this for Easter, right? As I've said many times before, this is the fullness of resurrection life ahead of us. So yes, there's a phase of life for Christians beyond dying and going to heaven. We come back to earth. And that's where hell comes in too. For while Christians go from one form of life in the spiritual heaven to another form of life in the, the new physical heavens and earth, those who have denied God go from one form of death in, in Hades slash Sheol to another form of death known as hell. For this point in our series in the book of Revelation, we have finally arrived at the place known as the Lake of Fire, also known as the Second Death, or as we know it most commonly, hell. Yes, just as resurrection life isn't here yet, technically, Hell isn't here yet either, for it doesn't come about until the day of the Lord. Revelation 20, 11 through 15 takes us there today, and it says that the day of the Lord will be like this. 
Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, so real quick, let's recap the afterlife as the Bible paints it, right? Real quick, everything we've said. Afterlife phase one, those who accept Jesus go to spiritual heaven. <laughs> those who reject Jesus go to Sheol slash Hades. All right, that's first one. Afterlife phase two, those who accept Jesus come back to earth to live eternally. Those who reject Jesus are sentenced to hell to die eternally. Okay, sorry if I'm shaking your biblical worldview, but we're still not done. Now, now I want to talk about the lake of fire. We've already seen that the afterlife is a little different from what we expected, right? Is it possible that hell itself is also different from what we've thought traditionally? I mean, I know a lot of you hope so. <laughs> Let's be honest, most of us struggle with the idea that God wants to torture people in hell for the next few trillion years. And since it's eternity, after those trillion years, he's just getting started, right? But I wonder if that's a fear that you should hold on to, uh, to make you question uh, this view. Because it's a question of morality for most of us, isn't it? We wonder how a loving, self-sacrificial, patient, compassionate, forgiving, good, good father could torment sinners of varying degrees for all eternity. If we as humans feel like, uh, like that seems morally off or questionable, shouldn't God's morality be even higher than ours? Isn't there something there that we feel we need to ask? Something that feels strange? Now, before we dig into the Bible to see what it has to say, let me say this. If God truly wants people to be tormented for all eternity, I'm willing to be okay with that because I know that his ways are higher than mine and that as unjust as eternal torment sounds to me now, God cannot commit injustice. All of his decisions are just, right, and wise always. So if that's what he wants to do, then, then it must be right. But when I read about hell in the Bible, I don't feel like it expresses it as eternal torment. I was always taught that it did, and I understand why. But I think if we do some really deep Bible study, we see that hell, this lake of fire, is ultimately supposed to do away with the person's existence. If resurrection is life beyond life, then hell is death beyond death. The Bible doesn't say that the human soul is immortal. That kind of thought came around after the Bible was written. The Bible more or less shows us that our life or our death is based upon our allegiance to Jesus. That yes, we can live forever if we are with him, but we cannot if we choose to side with sin instead of him. If we choose sin, then we give up the possibility of immortality. Immortality is not owed us, and it's not currently within us. Immortality is a gift called resurrection. And if we don't enter into the perfection of resurrection, then we cannot inherit the new perfect earth and the new perfect heavens. And therefore, we must be done away with. Because in the end, only righteousness and goodness will be left. And only resurrected bodies can adhere to such a life. And Jesus, the righteous judge, will decide where we belong. Have we allowed ourselves to be cleaned by him and, 
and made ready to live eternally? Or is there no place in the new world for us because we've denied him and so we must die eternally? So, yeah, truth be told, I don't think the Bible portrays hell as eternal torment. I think it portrays it as an eternal ending. Those who are sentenced there will cease to be as the lake of fire devours them. Now, that's not a conclusion I ever expected to reach in my theology. I actually blame the Bible for getting me here. More specifically, I blame Matthew. We just spent an entire year preaching through the Gospel of Matthew at 12.08, and he constantly made me preach about hell. It, it was so uncomfortable, but every time I flipped a page, there was Jesus, once again, talking about a fire called hell that people could avoid by repenting and turning from sin and following him. And so every other week, I felt like I had to dig deeper into this unpleasant theme of hell in order to stay faithful to preaching the scriptures. But being forced to preach on hell made me realize that the hell I had been taught didn't match the hell I was being given by Matthew. Uh, for example, Matthew 10, 28 says, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, if your body gets destroyed, and then your soul gets destroyed, what's left exactly? Nothing. You no longer exist in a physical state, and you no longer exist in a spiritual state. In other words, you no longer exist. The lake of fire that is hell has consumed you completely. Or how about Matthew 13, 40? Uh, Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. Jesus' parable here envisions hell as the fire that a farmer throws his weeds into. Now we don't expect the farmer to, to chuck all of these weeds into the fire and for the weeds to burn for all eternity, right? We expect them to be gone in an appropriate amount of time and to not exist anymore. Of course, Matthew 3.12 talks about more useless vegetation being burned up in an unquenchable fire. Now that sounds like more of a torturous, never-ending fire, doesn't it? An unquenchable fire? Well, at first glance it does, but we see unquenchable fires all the time in life, don't we? We've seen forest fires that refuse to go out. We've seen houses burn down until there's nothing left and the fire trucks just can't keep up with it. This is unquenchable fire. It can't be stopped. And eventually, it will have its way and burn everything down until it's gone. That. That's the kind of unquenchable fire I think hell is being likened to. No one should think that if they, they bring enough water to the lake of fire that they can escape, they can put it out. It will devour everything it's intended to devour until the fire is done. Likewise, Mark 9, 48 adds that worms don't die in hell, which leads many to believe that there will be torturous worms eating people up while they suffer in hell. But this picture is the same as the unquenchable fire. In the same way that you can't put the fire out, you also can't stop the worms from eating the corpses. They will eat until there is no more. Both analogies are trying to state the finality of the second death of hell. They're not trying to communicate some kind of never-ending torture. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus constantly refers to hell as a coming fire. What causes so many to believe that it, uh, it, it's eternal torment is the fact that Jesus often calls it an eternal fire. Eternal means forever and ever, right? Yeah, sometimes. But Ionios, uh, uh, the word for eternal in Greek, also seems to be used in reference to the age to come, the eternal age. Whatever happens in that age is eternal in a qualitative sense, not a temporal sense. In other words, it's about a time to come, the eternal time. It's not necessarily always a length of time, 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock p.m., right? You can kind of get a feel for that in Jude 7, where Sodom and Gomorrah is said to have undergone a punishment of eternal fire. Tell me, 
Is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? <laughs> no, right? That was a long time ago. But their sentence was eternal. It was final. And so Jude used is the term eternal. They underwent a fire that completely wiped them out until they were no more. Jude says that that's what hell will be like on the great day of judgment, like Sodom and Gomorrah. In the end, the main reason many still contend for a view of eternal suffering is because of the book of Revelation, where we're currently reading, right? For there are a few verses in Revelation that seem to be a bit more explicit in their eternal wording. Uh, for example, the most prevalent one, Revelation 14, 9 through 11. If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. So what do we do with a passage like this? Well, if there's one thing we've learned about John, he loves to quote Bible passages constantly throughout Revelation. And in this picture, he's actually trying to repaint the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah as the final judgment of hell. It's an analogy. For Genesis 19, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah has fire and sulfur and rising smoke, just like this lake of fire has. But what about it going on night and day? Well, this is a reference to a prophecy in Isaiah about an unquenchable fire in the land of Edom. But, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, we know that eventually the fire in Edom came to an end after it had burned up everything inside of it, right? Now, if you're like me, you're a bit blown away by how sturdy this annihilationist case is for hell. That things that go in the lake of fire are annihilated, done away with. I mean, I grew up being taught every single week in church that if you didn't follow God, he would torture you for all eternity. In fact, this was the evangelistic message at most churches on most weeks. Accept Jesus or unimaginable things will happen to you. And you can use the Bible to go that route if you want. But I've always had this fear that this view didn't match the character of God. But at the same time, I refuse to believe any other view because I figured that other views just didn't want to accept the Bible for what it said, or that they wanted to get rid of hell. But like I said, it was the Bible that changed my mind on this. I wasn't trying to study hell. Hell just kept popping up in my reading until I felt like maybe my traditional understanding didn't match what the Bible was saying. And to some extent, that's kind of odd, because it's been staring me in the face the whole time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not, what? Perish, but have eternal life. It's John 3.16, one of the most popular passages in the entire Bible. Now, some would look at the annihilationist view, this idea that we would perish without Jesus, and say that if we truly believe that, then we won't care about evangelism. Uh, because if people just cease to be, we won't be proactive. But I'm not sure why you would say that. Why would I, as a Christian, care less about other people's salvation if I think they die forever? <laughs> I still believe the sentence of hell is an eternal an irreversible one, and that they'll miss out on God's resurrection life without him. I have one chance to lead them to Christ, just like I did before. The importance of evangelism has not changed whatsoever with this view. Plus, I don't think the lake of fire is going to be a pleasant experience, and I don't want anyone to undergo it. This fire is called a torment in Revelation. While I may not think that it goes on for trillions of years, I, I don't know if it consumes them in a moment, or if it takes some time. So surely, if I don't want people to have to face torment for centuries, I also don't want them to face it in this moment, regardless of how long it ends up being. The annihilationist cares just as much about those uh, who are unsaved, 
just as much about them as those who hold this idea that they'll be tormented eternally. But at the end of Revelation, all things will be made right. And that means that all things that are wrong need to be done away with. Therefore, one needs to ask, can things still be right if hell is still here? It seems that Revelation gives us an emphatic no, that even hell itself needs to be done away with. For in today's passage, everyone who has ever died throughout the centuries is brought before Jesus so that he can pass judgment on every one of them. Then, before those who deny him are tossed into the lake of fire, first, death and Hades themselves are thrown into the lake of fire to be destroyed. Now, when people are thrown into this fire after death and Hades have gone away, they're not going to have a Hades to return to. Uh, the second death of the lake of fire will just destroy them. Just like it destroyed the first death, just like it destroyed Hades. The lake of fire is hell, and hell is the end of all ends. Of everything that's wrong. And the good news is that you don't have to be one of those things that's wrong. The good news is that if God had his way, everyone would choose to follow Jesus. They choose to follow him now and no one would be thrown into the lake of fire. That's what God wants. But he's not going to overrule your free will to, to make that happen. You have to choose between Jesus and Satan, righteousness and sin, heaven and hell. He's extending to you an invitation right now to join his kingdom, just like he did to me and to the rest of 1208. So if you haven't come to Jesus yet, the invitation is very good. <laughs> you can have resurrected eternal life in an immortal and imperishable body, living on this earth in the resurrection, just like you wish that you would that you can overcome death because Jesus will allow you, that you can live a good righteous life and sin will no longer be a problem. When all things are made right, the Holy Spirit will begin speaking to you now and working on you now to make you a part of what you will one day be. There's nothing you lose. <laughs> you only gain. Well, You'll lose the world, but in losing it, one day you gain it back when God brings you back. So if you haven't accepted Jesus, now's the time. He's not, he's not out to get you. He's waiting for you to come to him. The Bible actually says that uh, the reason God hasn't, Jesus hasn't returned yet like they thought he would a long time ago it's because God is patient, wanting more to be saved. So if you haven't come to him yet, you are part of the reason he hasn't returned. He wants you to be saved first, so that you don't head to the lake of fire, but instead you join him in heaven. And that, that's good news. <laughs>